Okay, folks, we are live on LinkedIn TV. Please do not swear. Um, so it's the, what are we in? Are we in March? It's the March episode of the Contact Center Network. And I am joined by two titans of industry, uh, Mr. Ben Booth, CEO of Max Contact, who I'm going to let him introduce himself in a second. And then the other titan, Martin Titan Teasdale, um, get out of app podcaster and founder of the team leader community so welcome to the show guys we've got um, a really great uh discussion to have today around your careers so hopefully something that's very dear to your own hearts uh but also we're talking about how the contact center agent role is no longer um, an entry-level role not that i believe it ever was actually um but we we, we want to suppose change a few mindsets and, and bust a few myths around why it's not um, a, a an entry-level role. But before we do that, um, let's get uh, into the thick of it with introductions. Um, so, Ben, I'm going to come to you first, please, because you're in my top right and corner. I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself a little bit and tell people who you are. And then, Martin, uh, Ben will hand over to you and then we'll jump into um, the agenda for today. So, Ben, over to you. Uh, so I'm Ben Booth, I'm the CEO of Max Contacts, we're a CCAS solutions provider based in the UK. hope that's enough. <laughs> Brilliant. No, <laughs> sure, more, you it, we're going to find out more about you um, shortly anyway. So um, Martin, over to you. Uh, thanks, Gary. And uh, it's good to be here with you and Ben. My name is Martin Teasdale and I do Get Out of Rap and the Team Leader Community. I'm going to keep it short as well. Brilliant. Well, we're going to find out a lot more about you both, because one of the um, the aspects of today's conversation that I want to look at is we, we talk about the contact center industry and, and sometimes it's referred to as a bit of a stopgap. So it's a bit like McDonald's. Everybody's had a stint in McDonald's and they've kind of done the done that. They've got the stripes and they've learned and they've gone on to do bigger and, and better things. Um, and, and I think sometimes the contact center industry can be maybe tarnished with the same brush. Not that there's anything wrong in working for McDonald's because I am a, a McDonald's alumni and I learned an awful lot uh, in that. But I think sometimes the, the contact center industry can be seen as one of those roles that you might do within university and you might do it for a time um, and you might kind of have your, 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 your opportunity to kind of get strap your headset on and then decide what you're doing as part of your career and then move on and do something else. And I think I've seen certainly through my own career and through a number of people that I've worked with people blossom and develop and do awesome things within the, the contact center industry. And I think very uh, similar to yourself, Martin, I think we're both champions of the fact that you can have a career in contact centers and you can have a really good career in contact centers. Um, and I think both yourself and Ben are testaments to that. Um, now, I, I know you outside of the, the LinkedIn bubble and we've met face to face, which is always a good good start. Um, and what I wanted to, to do today is just share some stories with our viewers and with the, the the LinkedIn community about the types of careers that you can have uh, within Contact Center. So I'm going to start the, the, the today's session just kind of going through both of your stories um, for, for a time and just understanding a little about how you've progressed um, within your roles because Ben you're a CEO, Martin you're a successful business owner so that's in itself testament to the fact that you can have um, a career and it can center around contact centers. So Ben, I'm gonna to come to you first, please, and just give you an opportunity really to, I suppose, share with the, the audience what your career path has been and maybe any kind of key strategies or experiences that you've had along the way that helped you have success um, in the contact center industry. So share a little bit of insight uh, with us, Ben, and, and tell us what your story is. Okay. Um, I mean, my, my first one of my first jobs outside of uni was cold calling to sell telco minutes, if you can believe it. And back in then days, it was, was uh, you ringing. <laughs> hey, no, well, yeah, yeah. You, you had a yellow pages and you ran through a yellow pages. There wasn't even import data. That's that's how old I am now. Um, in in ah. someone's conservatory, believe it or not. Um, right. So yeah, no, look, I, I started there. Um, I've been in the contact center industry virtually my entire career. Um, I was a technical engineer. I was first line support for products. I used to 
Then I became an implementations engineer. I've been involved in over 500 implementations of contact center systems. So I used to, that was when you used to have to go to site as well. So I used to go to site, train agents, train managers, deal with operational staff on how to improve efficiencies and all the things that go on in around the contact center as they've developed over the last 20 years, which I hate saying, 20 plus years. Um, in our organization, I would say there isn't a job I haven't done. Uh, so support, implementations, um, Products. I built our first website. Uh, I phone involved in marketing, did technical pre-sales, um, and about three years ago, I purchased the company off the founding owners, um, and it's been fun and games since then in the pandemic. So, yeah. um, and it's got me to where I am. But yeah, no, lots of experiences. Um, I think the contact center industry is a vibrant industry. I think across all the sites and use cases and companies I've worked with. Um, it's actually, I say this as a technology company, it's one of the most exciting industries. There isn't an industry that embraces technology, that uses it as much, that has so much opportunity opportunity as, as contact centers. I haven't come across one yet. Um, so I, I, I really think it's an exciting environment to work in. And I, I think both Martin and I would champion and, and high five you on that. And I think what, what's interesting to, to hear there, Ben, is that you've essentially you, you've done all of those different roles um, and you've kind of got a breadth of experience from frontline cold calling all the way now to a position when you're CEO. And, and I don't think many people think actually, right, when they, they jump on that run to maybe jumping on the phones or when they're cold calling, I don't think they necessarily correlate the, the two together, say, right, I could be CEO in X amount of years. But what was your... I suppose, what was your strategy? What was your, your way of thinking that kind of got you to that position uh, of actually running the show? What, what were some of the things? Did you, do you have, did you have a glide path in mind? Do you have a career path in mind or were you just winging it? <laughs> I'm laughing here because if you think I had a strategy that early in my career to get to be a CEO, you, uh, I'd love to say I did, but I didn't. No, um, I was always just someone who loved learning um, and I, I, I challenging myself. I, I think if you if you meet me there, the two things uh, I'm always learning. I like challenge. Um, I don't it's self for status quo, etc. So when I was involved in the industry, just that exposure, and I was lucky enough to go to. I used to one of my favourite parts of my job that I don't do as much anymore. Going to on site and learning about people, the industry, meeting new people, seeing the different ways people did work, what worked, what didn't, um, and it was just uh, that path, that flight path of having the right, being hungry, wanting wanting to learn, wanting to achieve, and just, you know, um, just wanting to be the best I could. And I think when you're around the industry and you see, even when you're in the contact centers, um, what it is they achieve and do on a daily basis, it's actually, it's, I mean, I say now I couldn't do that job. It's, it's yeah. actually quite an amazing job that they do. It's got so much more difficult from when I did it. So, um, yeah, just being around that, to be honest, it was always just exciting. And I think if you're always learning and, and recognize the opportunities around you, I think that goes unnoticed quite a lot. I think people mm. just see it as the job, actually recognizing the opportunities for learning around you in, in this environment, I think is important. Yeah. And that's got me to where I am today. Definitely. And, and I think learning and I, I think learning from others as well. I always talk about be a sponge of other people and, and pick up all their good stuff not necessarily everything about them absorb all the things that you like uh, all the things that inspire and all the things that you think are, are really great skills that they've got and make it your own um, and and if i was to ask you i suppose you've you've done a significant number of different roles and you said you've done all the roles within within max contact if there were maybe some key milestones for you that helped shape the trajectory that you 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 moved into um what would you say some of those are i'd say the biggest with what we do because we build the software that supports the industry is learning what's important learning the industry and, and that customer centric yeah. approach what's important what what makes a difference um especially to the people i mean i know we're going to get we always go on to ai in every webinar but it's always people first and i've been around Again, my age, numerous technology advances. And the first thing I will say about AI, it's, it's still going to be a people first technology. And having been able to see what the impact technology can play on people's day to day lives, coming to the job and having a good day versus a bad day, and then how that imp impacts their customers is, is actually yeah. been the, the biggest highlight of my career. I, I was lucky enough to have that exposure. So the reason I mentioned 500 installs plus. Is I had exposure to 500 contact yeah. centers 
what works and what doesn't and the difference it can make as well yeah and, and you know what i think i think that's fascinating that and i think when you start to get exposed to that that breadth of i suppose best practice and maybe not so best practice you start to kind of understand where you want to get to and, and what can be done differently so it, i suppose it sparks that level of innovation creation and and curiosity as to how you can do things different do you, do you think that's had any bearing on where you've ended up in in your career do you think no absolutely but um, I, I class myself and now um i say an engineer but more product background so you know we build a product to the end of the day. how do we know we build a product that's good it's that exposure of asking sitting down what works what doesn't what's good like you also say what's not good you learn that as well and that is yeah. still learning and this is the it, realizing sometimes those not goods are your best learnings because uh, you realize not what to do that's just as important um and yeah no it, it is is I've, I've been very lucky i've even you know traveled to different countries implementing south africa is a big one yeah. australia etc so you you actually see it from different demographics and cultures as well and it yeah. really does ex you can get exposure to a lot and if you're in, in that contact center you know you look at what they're doing how they do it but also the lives you're hitting for people you're helping i mean we have everything from suicide prevention lines all the way through to fraud prevention to sales to everything it, it, you really see actually the difference you make um and the, and to them and the people who are contacting yeah, yeah. them there's, there's a there's a lot there and and you know what you, you talk about luck there and and a lot of the times when we're in the contact center you might hear like oh i, I was lucky to get that role or I didn't get it because the person's face fit better than somebody else. So, so how much of, of, of your career would you say is luck versus how much of your career is actually, I put myself out there. I was determined. I showed an interest and how much of that do we kind of then say it was luck when actually I think there's probably a lot more of um, self drive there. Perhaps what, what do you think? Is it, is it luck or is it actually your yeah, DNA yeah, that's driven that? I'm being honest, and I hate saying this stuff, the one word people use to describe me is I'm driven. Um, I just yeah. don't believe in failure. <laughs> I just It's not a word every, in everything I do. So I want people to succeed, and I drive things. So it is it is putting yourself out there. It's challenging yourself. It's uh, putting yourself forward. It's uh, putting yourself outside your comfort zone. I mean, I mentioned I've done other jobs around the business. I'm yeah. not sales. I don't see myself as sales. never did. Um, but I'd go and sit in front of a client, and I used to sell well because of, I was a... I understood the industry. I understood the challenges oh, yeah. and the people. So, it, but it, it's you have that opportunities, and I would say in anyone's career, um, take the opportunities, go sideways if you can. That exposure around the business has got me where I am today because I had to do some marketing. I'm not good yeah. at marketing. I don't put my marketing team now, but I got exposure to lots of areas of the organisation, which means as you move, start moving up to an organisation, you've got that operational awareness of impact around the business. And these are the type of things that I would say if people can do, don't be afraid of them and move forward. Yeah. Oops. Gone silent on my side. Oh. I think I'm getting a little bit of feedback there, but um, can you still hear me? Yeah. Brilliant. All good. Um, so, I, you know what? I, I think that's, it, it's really admirable to hear that, Ben. And I think when, people in in roles like yourself i think sometimes we can say right it is luck but I, I think there's a lot of characteristics and a lot of traits and a lot of behaviors that kind of form and, and shape um who you are and and how you work so i i think it's it's interesting to hear what you've done how you've done it and and where it's got you i think if if i was to kind of come to you martin and as as a, a business owner that's kind of moved from the operation into running a business and and listening to to what ben said there is there anything that ben said there that particularly resonates i think not having a a set out career path of seizing opportunity being being curious um and just put putting yourself out there i think you know one of the things that we see in our industry more than most i think is change and the people that do well are the ones that kind of walk towards it and go, oh, what's this? How do I get involved in this? Oh, this looks interesting. Yeah. Um, and and just that, you know, that kind of no step backwards. Now, that that can mean, you know, I 
one of the things that we talk to the girls at the football team that um, I manage is you win or you learn. You know, there, there's no such... You, you shouldn't be thinking, oh, I've been knocked back. Today I've failed at things, but I've learned, I've learned a lot. So our industry is a, is a perfect environment where you're surrounded by opportunities, but they're not going, they're not necessarily going to be presented to you. Like, do you want this one? Do you want this one? Sometimes you've got to go and, and find them out your, yourself. And if you do that and you have a growth mindset, cause that's the other thing Ben said that I really kind of thought, Oh, I, I felt a connection there, which is I want to, I, I'm constantly wanting to, to learn. And that's, you know, we understand that now, as a key part of having a growth mindset. Mm. So in terms of what's been the single biggest thing that I would look at my career and go, even without plans, what's helped me, it would be that I've had a, a, a growth mindset that I'm okay, not knowing something, yeah. uh, but I, I, I want to, I want to get better at it. I'm okay being brand new at something. I'm okay with being, not at the top of a league table that's cool great yeah. no problem yeah and you know what i think you you've probably had the same experience that i've had is that you go into um you go from being a, either a frontline agent or in in a sales team where you, you're doing a really great job and then all of a sudden i mean you've talked about this in 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 uh talks and seminars that i've seen you at where you overnight you become a team leader uh, and all of a sudden you're you think you're supposed to have all the answers and you think you're supposed to be the absolute oracle and you've gone from being the most uh, aware person and the most in in the know person to somebody who's being called upon by 12 13 14 different people and you suddenly don't have the answers and i think that's i i think that's where you learn that i suppose that grit and that that growth mindset piece is say so, right if you think you have to know all the answers you you're going to struggle what what's your what's your thoughts on that martin I think, um, you know, I, I was an agent for a good few years and I was I, I was near the top, but I wasn't the top. And um, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I actually went for, I asked to be included in a team leader assessment day. And I, and I said, I, I don't necessarily want the job. I just want to go for development. Yeah. Um, and I, and I scored the highest. So, uh, I created a bit of a problem and I call, I call it the, the magic weekend, you know, Friday I was an agent and they said, can you start the role on Monday? So over that weekend, I didn't magically develop leadership skills, emotional intelligence skills. Yeah. And initially when I started as a team leader, I would say I was a bit of a, a disaster because, um, <laughs> I assumed that my team would be 15 versions of me, um, that they were motivated the same way. They like to be communicated the same way. They like to have fun the same way. Um, and they, and they perceived their job the same way I did. So all of my broadcasting, all of my management initially was based on that. And I alienated and left behind half my team in, yeah. you know, instantly they, they, because they couldn't connect to me and I wasn't trying to connect to them on an individual level. I thought, well, it's worked for me. It must work for everyone else. And everyone must be as enthusiastic about working here as me. So off I go. Um, and again, you know, coming back to that point about it took, it took the intervention of the contact center manager to say, you know, do you know that half your team literally cannot <laughs> They're not resonating <laughs> with you at all. So what what are you going to do about it? Um, and that was the first kind of like, okay, I, I need to start looking at this role and taking it seriously yeah. and thinking, how do I, how do what what does it mean to be a team and what does it mean to be a team leader over and above? You're doing your coaching, you're doing your quality, you're monitoring the SLAs, you're dealing with escalations. Um, you're dealing with disciplinaries or whatever it may be. Actually, it's it's your creation of that esprit de corps within the team mm. is based on connections, right? So how do you do that? Um, and yeah, so that that was my first kind of venture into so you cutting leadership. your teeth into into a leadership role 
and and look where you are now. And and I, and I, and I think you know what I think people there's be, there'll be a lot of people on this call and and Stephen Miller's just uh, dropped a, a comment into that which we'll we'll come to um, in a second. But there'll be a lot of people, Martin, who uh, are in who are in your shoes now or have been in your shoes that are like, how do I get to be the next Martin Teasdale? How do I get to build that community? And how do I, I get to kind of assert my authority in that contact center leadership space as you have? And, and don't be bashful because because you have, you've got a, a real good um, community around you that you, you, you've built over a long period. Um, so talk to me about your career and some of the, the, I suppose, the key bits that have influenced your career over your tenure and how you ended up where you are now and, and maybe what were some of the as ben said earlier some of the highs and the the crashing lows um for, for your career so talk, talk to me a little bit about that um i i think and it's something now was a uh, you know we're in we're a senior in more senior in age and we have more influence than we've ever had i think it's we now have a responsibility to try and pass some of this on because if i look back at my if i look back at my career it's there's key people in my career who saw th potential in me where i didn't necessarily see it in myself and they in in some instances pushed me into projects and roles um which i did not think i was up to and they were okay with me failing you know they were okay with me going are you really do you mean me you know what one in particular um i was working for a big bpo and we'd acquired a company in turkey and there was going to be an initial project team that was to go out there and they needed an operational lead and this was a contact center out there that had 600 people in it now i hadn't even manage that number in the uk let alone in a in a very different foreign country, foreign country yeah. and our director at the time she called me into her office i thought i was getting told off again because she used to tell me off quite often but she's very <laughs> candid um and she said I want you to go to turkey and lead the operations out there um and it's that kind of mentorship and championing that um uh, has been key in my in my career i think you need you know this this word community we love it um within that community you need people who will be candid with you you need people who um will back you um and i, I look back to some of the key things that have happened even now with um what started with the podcast then became the team leader community i've gone to people that i know will trust I, I trust will give me a straight answer and that might not be the one i would necessarily want to hear at the time but i know they've got my back so you know a, a network a community and a good mentor have been fundamental in my in my career someone that spotted something about me and gone yeah, you can do this. You know, yeah. you can absolutely do this. And and again, I think sometimes those opportunities that are that are afforded to us can be perceived by others externally that you you it was a lucky break. Somebody saw something in you um, because of because they liked you or because they got on with you. Um, what what's your your thoughts on on those kind of conversations? Is is that more of um a cultural challenge within an organization that isn't necessarily creating open career pathways or is it about individuals like yourself who've demonstrated capability demonstrate an appetite and a want to learn but very similar to ben very uh very focused on learning and development are those the people that get spotted because they're putting themselves out there um i i think we're all bought into it there has to, everything has to be driven by a fair process you know it's not it's not um it's not you know those kind of a, a friends network the, the fundamental I, I love this idea that there are you know a lot of things that do not require any talent and hard work is one of them and curiosity is another and whilst there may have been more talented people than me no one worked harder 
uh, than me. I, I, that kind of showing up every day, that was me. And I, and I worked hard. But I also worked hard on finding out about the business I was in. I would, and, and again, a lot of sched, a lot of the scheduling team when I was an agent were like, "Where's he wandering off to now?" Because I would just walk into, I would walk into other rooms and go, "What is it?" Planner's nightmare. <laughs> yeah, you know. But again, that's something around. I bought into our industry when I looked around and saw every single person in marketing, finance, HR, training, IT. 80% of them had been on the phones where I was yeah. not that long ago. And, and the penny dropped and I was like, oh, my God. And also, you just get to, you get to see that different perspective. You understand why scheduling do the things they do. You understand why what the challenges training have. But you, you, you have to go out there yeah. and make relationships and make connections. You know, so um, that was me. But like I say, I think we are we, we have to have processes in place especially now we're far more aware of neurodiversity right that yep. someone might not be an extrovert they might not show up in a certain way but they could be the greatest leader you you could ever have mm -hmm. if your process allows them to to evidence that so did that answer your question? Yeah, no, sure. I, I, I think, I, and, and you know, you, you've touched on some some really good points there, and um, we'll pull some of those out in the um, in the Q and A. And there's already some interesting comments um, starting to come into the uh, into the LinkedIn comment section. So, if anybody does have a question, now is a great opportunity to start firing those into the uh, into the comments on LinkedIn, and we can share them um, for for the panel. But there's one question that I wanted to jump into for you, Martin, before we jump into the um, the, the Q&A section for today is, I suppose you did um, a lot of the get out of rap stuff in, in your own time. And before you, you went into being a, a business owner, um, you, you were given that uh, opportunity to create that um, that dynamic for the, for the business. Um, how do you, I suppose, or what advice would you give to individuals that maybe feel like they don't have that capacity or don't have that opportunity to be able to do something a little bit more um, creative like that whilst in role and whilst um, having to balance the, the two jobs, I suppose. Um, I'm a huge advocate of starting something on the uh, as a side hustle. You know, it's, yeah. it's not necessarily the phrase, the term that I like the most, but... Yeah. Um, we've never had more access to everything you're ever going to need to be able to do anything you want. And the advent of great technology means, you know what, if you want to create a children's book, it, do a bit of research for one night. The next night you could be having a go doing it. The night after you could, it could be published on, on Amazon. You know, so I think for me, I wanted an outlet of, uh, something that I was passionate about um, in my and you know, like you say in my own time, I was like, oh, this is fun. And Ben mentioned something earlier around that kind of I want to be a learner. I want to learn something. I want to learn something new. And we all have access to everything you're ever going to need to be able to become on that path. Anyway, you know, I'm. I don't. I still don't believe I'm competent. I never will be because I'm. I love the process of developing you know yeah. so um i would i'm a huge advocate of it and i think companies now are fully aware especially with the next generation coming in that having a very progressive policy around this is a uh, uh, entices people you know why aren't we helping people foster these kind of entrepreneurial skills i would want to work for a company that said Hey, you know what? If you want to get a second income from your own stuff, yeah. we'll help you. Here's what you might. Here's some resources you might want to think about. I think that's, I think that's the way forward. I, I definitely agree. And you know, we've got some really interesting comments coming into the chat now. There's one that's just dropped in from Keith Stapleton that I'm itching to uh, to get to in in a second. But before we do that, um, I'm going to ask the first question. I'm going to ask you to. Um, to, to lead on this one, Martin, and then and then Ben, I'm going to come to you. And, and I think it's around that whole piece now in terms of how do we, I suppose, express to the, the, 
the wider recruiting community or, or people within who are customers of contact centers um, and some of the changes that we're, we're seeing as a result of some of the conversations that um, we're now having to have in, com in contact centers is the skills that we've got within the contact center community and you've touched on them uh, a lot already in terms of that emotional intelligence piece but if i was to ask you looking at the contact center as you were and as you are now and, and ben this is you you, me you mentioned a good point about this as well which I, I'll, I'll come to in a second but in terms of the the skills and how they've evolved in the last i'd say last five years let alone last 10 years how would you say contact center skills have changed and what are the essential skills for a contact center agent that they need to have now martin i think we are we are we reflect how society's changed right so cust, cust we we as customers have changed our requirements are higher our service expectations are higher and we have to match that and higher to that and that means that we need to really make sure that we're offering people great careers, but also kind of checking that they have the right skill set and behaviors in order to thrive in a in what is still a challenging environment. You know, um, things like being excellent communicators, being emotionally intelligent, being adept at ever changing technology, being change agents. All, all of these things are now things that we're we're looking for when I know when I first walked into a contact center the fact that I was wearing clothes and could talk meant I got the job you, you, got, know. you had a pulse <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know because two hours later I was on the phone with yeah. a bit of paper following a script now thankfully we've evolved so much more since then um, because customers require more you know we uh you're dealing with more complex inquiries all the time um and that that requires a, a different a, a different recruitment and onboarding process but i i think fun, you know the fundamentals i think are still there the fun the fundamentals of what constitutes a good customer facing employee in our industry are still pretty much the same. We've just got a better understanding of how, what the component parts are, yeah. and how do we how do we identify them? And I, I mentioned neurodiversity. You know, kind of, I think we're far more accommodating of that, and we've realised it's it's previously been an untapped pool of resource for us that can deliver a different. We know that organisations are better if they have a a real broad section of the way people think and operate you know brings different ideas to the to the table so um definitely you know I, for a long time i was amazed that when it came to recruitment one of the things that seemed to be missing was we didn't really test or see whether people were able to learn communication skills you know how we how we listen how we how we how we communicate our services and products wasn't really a big part of either recruitment or onboarding if thankfully it is now mm. and, I, and i think you you make some really good points and i think ben you talked earlier to say that actually if you were doing the job of a frontline agent now you'd probably struggle um so mm. how, how how do you think um the the i suppose the role of the contact center agent has evolved in that way um, and what makes it so challenging and what are the skills that you think they, they need that might help bridge that gap this yeah okay is, is most contact say agents now are working on multiple systems um dealing with uh, i'll say a wider demographic of people um, than they've ever dealt with before uh, and that adapt everyone mentions emotion terms but also adaptability and when we say communication i refer to in most organizations here's you know, the difference in stakeholder communication, but actually being able to adapt your language and how you talk when you're dealing with different personality traits. That is actually a skill you mentioned earlier, Matt, Martin, when you get promoted, you think everyone is like you and you <laughs> communicate them with like you. And that is a skill, I learned that the hard way as well, by the way. Um, it, you know, they learn these skills. And I, I think any company, if you're a recruiter, we recruit from the industry. And if you were to, what is your ideal team player that you want to recruit and the values or the attitudes um, of individuals. And you talk about emotional intelligence, teamwork, honesty, 
adaptability, all these things you, you put in. Uh, customer centric, what organization doesn't want customer centric? They all come and are all skills learned in a contact center. And if a recruiter was I'm do it's a, out in the industry in general, recruiters are missing out on an untapped pool of resources that are there. And actually, you know, there's only so many promotions within a contract contact center you can do. So actually, mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's quite a wide uh, talent pool there to look at. I say we do it, um, and those skills are learned. And it's it's a different type of people you get as well. I, I don't know how to, why that is. But yeah. there is a bit of resilience there. It's a hard job. I mean, if you want support, typically we have support. You only get called when someone's got a problem. They don't get called and say, you're doing a good job. Thanks for your service. So, you know, there is a little bit of that there that is missing as well. Um, and it's, it's if you like say overarching, it's, it's, it's a, we're just, just great. I'll be honest. Um, like I say, we do it. Our product owners come from the industry. And I don't know many people in the industry who didn't start on the phone. And now the ops directors, the the head of at CX, the head of people, yeah. head of staff, because they're used to dealing with such a wide variety and they understand mm-hmm. how to deal with people, what motivates them, how to engage with them, how to you know get the North Star that we'll get behind, especially in this more hybrid work. So, yeah, yeah m- massive um, talent pool there that I think is untapped. I think it's also, like I say, going back to people working in the industry, recognize the skills you're earning. And when you get more senior in a business, mm-hmm. they're the skills you look for. Actually, you're not yeah. looking for whether you're technical and you can Google X, Y, and Z. As you go into management and spreading your career, it's those soft skills that you're looking yeah. for. And that's what you're building very early on in your career as well, actually. I think you can see a bit of a wave. You, you, you build the skills. You might lose them in your mid part of your mid-20s, where they're not as important. But as you get in late 20s, 30s, they become yeah. more important. Definitely. And, and I think you, you, raise, you raise a really interesting point around internal promotion and I, and I think we've got two two aspects to think about here is one we want to drag people into the industry and, and make them see how great the industry is but also we want to nurture the talent um, that exists internally so we afford them the opportunities that that we've all had uh, as agents that, that move on to that I think we're in a slightly different world now aren't we as well where we've got less visibility of those skills and and perhaps less connection Um, with people that might be able to see those skills and give us those opportunities that we've had. And Keith asked this question in the, in the chat, he says, with remote working being more prevalent, um, how do we, how do people get noticed? Um, And he doesn't want statistics apparently. So (laughs) how do we, how do we do that? So Ben, given that kind of you finished on that topic, I'm going to come to you and then Martin, um, if I could get your thoughts as well. So what do you think, Ben? I, I, I put it on the companies, to be honest. I think, you know, what motivates people? One's recognition. So if you haven't got those type of things in place where recognition gets surfaced up in a hybrid working environment, I, I will say that's on the company and you've probably got a bigger problem. Um, so, I mean, we're virtually remote. We're in one day a week, as an example. So, how, you know, even in any business, how do you recognize um, people, like you said, neurodiversity? We're a software company. We have people from one end to the other. Uh, introverts are quite common in our uh, sector so you've got to put the things in place that allow for that to happen and i was on a webinar the other day that just doesn't happen it's and it's on businesses as leaders um to make sure we have recognition schemes that everyone's got a voice they can put people forward not just awards everywhere but actual meaningful recognition we tie ours back to for example our house values yeah. so we who's achieving those house values because that's we, it's a big part of what we promote on again going back to those soft skills rather than technical skills so put all those things in place um it is hard i will say that it is there's no one one thing that will solve that problem it's lots of things that have to be done together well where all of a sudden it will fit yeah. together and recognition starts happening and just start should coming up through the organization yeah. but i agree I, I don't think it should be statistically either yeah. Um, what 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 do you think, Martin? Do you, do you think there's a there's more of a challenge for people working in a remote environment for that mobility in their careers? I, I love this question. Um, we it's things like this we talk about quite often in the in the team leader community, right? Um, yeah, potentially it means that you can't kind of show up and interject, but there are things that can be done. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're remote or not you know, an unasked for report with suggestions and solutions 
someone who understands the business well enough because they're at the cutting edge that's taken the time to put something together and share it upwards and sideways or or whatever straight away yeah. you're going to get noticed straight away someone will go what's this oh it's really good um or even if it isn't really good it's just that sense of willing and that you're bought into into the organization and i think even remote teams are still meeting teams have cadence and routines mm. i can remember being a contact center manager team leader my team members who said can i run the meeting can i take minutes can i do the actions can i uh, put together a team exercise a team game i was like yeah of course you can you can do them all if you want um but straight away <laughs> that person is getting themselves noticed because uh, they're, they're, they're put in. And, it, and I don't think it necessarily means that you have to burn the midnight oil. It doesn't. It just means to show that you're yeah. willing, that you're, you want to take a step forward. Yeah. You want to contribute to what it means to be yeah. part of our team and therefore our organization. You know, to be that positive disturbance um, – I like something Ben said around around the company, you know, kind of have have companies got a process in place by which they can get good ideas and feedback over and above uh, a pulse survey. You know, have you, is, is there a stream for ideas that allow, you know, you can come in and go, I've noticed this, this would be improved by doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah. You know, that, that kind of thing. So I, I yeah. think there's ample opportunity. And I would still say, um, that it starts with putting your hand up and saying, I want to go, f I, I volu volunteer for the next project. Please, can I be on it? You know, those it, types it of sound things. like Katniss Everdeen. It's like the contact center games. <laughs> Love it, Martin. <laughs> and, and I think what you, what you've said there and what Ben, you alluded to is, is summarized by one of the, one of the people who've made a, a comment in the, uh, the LinkedIn is that it has to be organizational culture. Um, that allows the opportunity to, to manifest itself. But I think that also goes with the conversations that you're having with your team leaders and the, 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 your own passion for development and your own passion um, for wanting to progress. And I think even in remote environments, generally we tend to have one-to-ones. Uh, we'll still have coaching conversations. So it's surfacing those desires up um, in those um, instances that I think is going to help generate that internal mobility. Thinking about it from an external perspective then, if we were trying to bring a whole new wave of generation into the contact center, and I think um, Stephen earlier talked about this, and you've already talked about it, Martin, in terms of the opportunities that are around the contact center, team manager, training, WFM, BI, marketing, finance. We've talked about all of those different roles and those different opportunities, but I don't necessarily think people externally who view a contact center view all of those different dimensions to it um so martin i'm going to ask you to, to start with is is what do we need to do as an industry to promote ourselves better to invite the next wave of people into the contact center because otherwise we're all just going to get old and we'll have nobody left <laughs> so what's what's your we, thoughts we we need to market ourselves better externally so as an industry we we are great at talking amongst ourselves we need to we need to start pushing this outwards and look at the um it made headlines on the bbc that when stephen bartlett yeah. came out and said uh he learned the most about being a ceo when he was on the phones and all of a sudden it's like oh he worked in a call center you know yeah. so we we need to do we need to do more of that but i i, I genuinely think you know, we can't wait for the ma mainstream media to have an epiphany and go, actually, these are, this is a great industry. Um, what I think we have to do is if all of us, everyone who's watching this webinar, who we see every day on LinkedIn, if we all made a commitment this year to work with education and careers advisory centers, to go out and do talks just one talk each everyone to go out and talk to a school you know because when i was looking for a job at the end of university at no point was this an, an option i had no awareness of the size and breadth of this industry so 
I think we need to be out there, um, and, you know, start at a local level. Find find your yeah. local sixth <laughs> form and go, I would love to come and talk at your next yeah. available opportunity about what makes up nearly 5% of this country's GDP and employs nearly a million people and is a wonderful, wonderful industry to work in yeah. that your school leavers would love. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it starts there. Education for yeah. me. What what's um what's your views on that, Ben? Would would you have, would you agree with Martin, or, or or is there more that we can do, or something different, um that you've seen, and and maybe what he, what's even in your own recruitment strategy? Yeah, no, it's it's tough, and I, I think we're, we're we're paying the price from previous years, decades ago, actually. That it got a bit of a bad name, the old PPI at yeah. RCA, and uh, and we're still fighting that, and I do believe we are. And to your point, I the industry. You said nearly a million people indirectly it's a lot higher yeah. think about software companies like ourselves and back office agents is seven hundred and fifty thousand plus agents yeah. alone um and it it it's tough because you're fighting you mentioned mainstream media where there's one bad story gets put, put on the, the bbc or whatever website or we, we were talking earlier someone has one bad experience and it's all over linkedin mm. um what we don't talk about oh is the millions of interactions every single day that are that and the great things you get from it. And everyone now, the biggest thing any company that I speak to, and this isn't just as our industry looks for, is you know customer-centric people. Everything's about people. And you will not get a better experience in dealing with people than working in the contact center industry. It just doesn't exist. Um, and learning customers and interactions. There's more data and more information on what we understand about our clients that it's becoming an engagement center contact centers not just a contact that. center that term i think will yeah. die in the future but how do we promote that how do you fight the the industry it's, i do believe it's talking about but we we have to promote people into the industry when we recruit in and everyone that comes and works thinks it's a really exciting industry how do you i agree it's tough i've thought about this um and i think it's doing what we do um in all honesty what you two do as well um and it it's a uh, it's a change that needs to happen. Um, you know, when you have a problem, my story, I always say, and you pick up the phone and you want help, who are you speaking to? Who do you get through to? Yeah. You're getting through to a, a contact center. Yeah. And everyone needs that service, whether it's a, a broken phone, your boiler, or whatever it may be. Now, you get through how you, you get through to contact center to help, and you, you appreciate that help on the person at the yeah. other end that solved that problem for you. And why... Why has that got such a negative stigma? I don't yeah. actually don't know. I think it, we're fighting from decades ago. Um, but keep talking about it. Keep doing what we're doing. And eventually, I think that tide will turn. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. There's some of the, the comments that are in the um, in the chat that around from, from recruiters. So people like Julie Mordew from, from Green Bean. Great to see that you're, you're doing things that are, are generating a, a real appetite there. So they developed a program called Grow which uses concepts of learn boarding, which I really like that, to, to attract talent into the contact center. And I, and I think there's that foundational piece, isn't there? I mean, you can do apprenticeships now in contact center. You can do apprenticeships in operational management that you can use in a, as transferable skills that can be directly applied into the contact center. So I think that's fantastic that the stuff that, that Julie's doing there. I think Joe Finneton, um, I think re another really great point. And it's, it's about that um, beating your own drum as an industry so generating those internal success stories from staff and i think to your point martin i think there's um there's a really good one to say let's get some of the agents in front of um six formers in front of people in career days and have them talk about their their movement and their mobility um so it's seen as more of a, an opportunity i suppose across the patch that those are opportunities exist and i, I mean we're all here and we've got collectively a lot of years between us in, in the contact thanks center. I, yeah. <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> but I think if, I mean, if you added up all of the, the, the years of everybody who's watching this and, and everybody who's listening and contributed, there probably is around 700 plus years. Um, so I think if we can stay in an industry for this long, and do all of the different roles that we've done within an industry, then actually I think it, it's it's a brilliant industry for any anybody else um, to join. And I think to Joe's point, we need to beat the drum a little bit more and, and share some of those um, success stories. Um, I'm going to wrap 
today's session up, but I just want to um, ask, I suppose, if there was one piece of advice, Martin and Ben, that you were giving to a, a striving contact center agent who wants to get position as self-made entrepreneur, Martin, or CEO of a business, what would that piece of um, advice be? And I'm going to come to you first, Ben. Oh, I hate these questions. <laughs> it's always on the spot. That wasn't in you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, we, I, I'm just going to bounce on what we said earlier. It's recognize the opportunities and learnings you've got in front of you. Um, it's, Mike mentioned this a lot. It's it's being curious. It's, it's a contact center isn't just, a, you can learn so much from the whole contact center, not just that single job and, and go out, learn as much as you can and recognize you in yeah. an environment where you can absorb a lot of knowledge. I would say mentorship is something I didn't do in my career early enough. Yeah. Expand, your, expand your community as fast as you can. And you, you, you can't not learn um, yeah. important skills that will t- take you in life. And it's, 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 and it's exciting. Um, but yeah, curiosity, drive, and, and in today's world, and for the one unpopular opinion is you, you own your own development as much as the businesses. So yeah, don't sit there waiting for it to happen. It doesn't always yeah. happen. Go out and, like mine said, yeah. ask the questions. Be curious. It gets recognized. If you, you only have to do it a few times and people pick up on it and go, they've got the right attitude. Let's give yeah. them a challenge to put yourself out Brilliant. there a bit more. Fantastic. And, and Martin, final, final nugget from you. Um, that you are good enough. I think it's, I think for young people especially, it's – it's a it's an internal challenge they face all the time where um which lends itself then to having imposter syndrome i think don't compare yourself with other people you are good enough and and to take a chance there's no bad outcome if you take a chance if you have an idea just do it just try it yeah and const and then evolve you know there's no bad outcome you've just got to go and do it but you've got to You've got to ignore the voice in your head that tells you you can't do it. You're not good enough. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. And I think that's a fantastic point to end on this. You are Faba, Abba. Take a chance. Take a chance. Take a take a chance. chance. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ben. To, let's end on end on that little bit of hilarity. Um, thanks very much, Ben, for for joining us. Martin, thank you uh, for joining us. Thanks to everybody who's um, commented in the uh, in the chat. Really great discussion. I'll ask Ben and Martin to stay on for just sixty seconds more. But that is the end of today's live stream. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next month.